physician, he gives us the prescription. Here is the prescription. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So in terms of salvation, we can't draw any near to God than we already are. But when we place our trust and faith in Christ to save us, we are immediately baptized by the Holy Spirit and we are accepted into the body of Christ. That's what we see in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. When we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, we get the redemption. That's what we see in Ephesians 4.30. God giveth more grace when the burden grows greater. God sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he added his mercy. He multiplied the trials. He multiplied the peace. So his grace is beyond our comprehension. But to have that grace and mercy, we need to humble ourselves. Gracious God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your presence, Lord. Thank you for bringing us together during the end of this week. Your words always lead us to the right path, Lord. Help us not only to listen to the words, but follow accordingly, Lord. Help us always to claim your promise and follow your instructions. You speak, Lord, we listen and surrender ourselves and lead us in the right path. Help us to rivet this message deep in our hearts. Thank you for hearing this prayer, Lord. Amen. 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 We will continue to look into the chapters of James. We are moving into a new chapter for today, we will be looking into James chapter 4, verses 1 to 10. Before we go into this new chapter, we will see like what we had looked into in the past. As you do remember that we are looking into real faith produces genuine works. This is the big picture of the whole book of James, under which we are right now looking into a subdivision. Real faith produces genuine humility. Last week we were talking about, uh, last month, I'm sorry, last month we were talking about the humility under which we saw like wise unwise, and the signs and the characteristics and the results. To be putting those in a nutshell, we did see like two fruits, fruits of the unwise and fruit of the wise. So in fruits of the unwise, what we saw is the bitterness and the jealousiness, the selfish ambition within us brought about arrogance, lying, and that was earthly, and it is so natural of us, and it is also demonic. And because of that, it led to disorder and evilness. And the fruits of the wise, what we saw last time, is like our good behavior and our good works, the good deeds, they were always and they are always pure, peaceable, genuine, gentle, reasonable, merciful, and they are bountiful and sincere. And because of this, there was P. 
peace and righteousness. This is what we saw last time. But this is again coming under the subdivision of real faith produces genuine humility. Today we will be continuing on the theme of humility in this particular section. James chapter 4 verses 1 to 10. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scriptures say that, say without reason, that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us, but he gives us more grace. That is why scripture says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. This section, when James is writing, he's, st he's starting with fights and quarrels. If you see, like, fighting and quarreling among us, it's so common nowadays. It's, it's not common now. I think, like, the, the reason why James wrote thousands of years ago is this fight was even common during those times. If you look into the history through the Bible, you all know the very first fight was between Cain and Abel. And that ended up in the very first murder. Since then, the history has got a lot of conflicts and war. As I told, James had a purpose mentioning about the fights and the quarrels. And again, watch carefully. He is addressing this to Jewish Christian believers. He is not addressing this to unbelievers. Always be reminded of this. So the reason why he's been pointing this is Believers, they worship, they fight, they pray, they worship, they fight, and pray. This is a cyclic event that James was noticing, and he thought he should address this issue. If you look into the previous chapter, what we saw last month, James 3 and now we are now looking at James 4. See, I think like it is actually a continuation of what James was mentioning in the previous chapter is almost getting to a climax here in chapter 4. 
as you all know like when james wrote he did not make this as chapters he just wrote a whole letter but it is for our convenience we have bre- broken them into chapters so whatever he was trying to mention in chapter 3 the major themes is almost getting to a climax here in chapter 4 what he was mentioning in chapter 3 if you do remember was the open conflicts how we have to control our tongue that's what we saw earlier what happens here in chapter 4 is because of this jealousiness and their selfish nature what we saw last time there are more fights and quarrels that is what he is building now in chapter 4 what is what is so um interesting here is james is mentioning about the reasons for the fight among the believers but he doesn't stop just like that by pinpointing the reasons like a doctor or a physician he is diagnosing the reason for the conflict and he is also prescribing for handling how to deal with the conflict so he is he is not just pinpointing something but he is also letting us know how we have to deal with this if you look into the very first verse it's a direct question to these people what causes fights and quarrels among you if you if you look into today's world there is fighting everywhere people who turn their backs to god they do not have the spirit in them they do not have the word of the god which is the truth they don't have the truth and these people are characterized by their fighting we see fighting in businesses we find fighting in politics we find fighting in educational institution we find fighting and quarreling within families ruining marriages and above all fighting in the church this is the specific area of conflict james had in mind at that time when he was writing this christian believers were in an ongoing state of quarreling that often exploded into an open conflict um i think like when i was uh, preparing this message i do remember like when we were in india i think like when we were um uh, having the television at that time and then the tv like they used to say this vaartha vandu tadichu vandanaala kai kalapala mudinjiruchu which is exactly what james is mentioning what we saw when chapter 3 if you don't control your tongue the reason what happens it ends up in fights and quarrel what we are love looking into james chapter 4 there may be a question for every one of us where does this fighting and quarrel come from we most of the time we always immediately say oh this fight started and this quarrel started probably this is all like demonic or satanic but james has got a totally different answer for this the source he says 
the source is because of our desire it's because of our pleasure turn to james chapter 1 and verse 14 we saw this probably we might have forgotten i wanted to remind this james chapter 1 verse 14 it says temptation comes from our own desires which entices and drags us away i'm reading this to emphasize and to make us remember the sins whatever we are doing or undergoing is because of our own desires similarly turn to james chapter 3 verse 16 here again he mentions for wherever there is jealousy and ambition there you will find disorder and evil of every kind so the fight and the quarrel that are found among these jewish christian believers the source james is mentioning it's their own desire that's what he was mentioning about in the first chapter what we just now read and again how we have to have that wisdom in chapter 3 verse 16 so it's not the devil it's not satanic but we fall as prey for whatever satan is putting as a bait and we are falling because of our own desires but the problem comes why there is a fight why there is a desire what happens to this desire what happens to our pleasures to be very very simple here when we have our desire or we have a goal or we have a pleasure we try to attain when something steps in between that watch carefully our desires our goals our achievements when something comes in between that is the time it starts a conflict when something is impeding the way of our fulfilling our desires there is frustration and there is fighting moving on to the next verse you desire but do not have so you kill you covet but you cannot get what you want so you quarrel and fight you do not have because you do not ask god you have to be very very careful here the killing or the murdering whatever james here is mentioning is not like literally killing somebody physically i think like uh, way back in our message group we had this message taken by brother johnson wherein we saw like how people try to assassinate other people character wise killing other people even dr jack mo was mentioning in this in some of his messages how people though they claim to be christian believers try to 
assassinate another person. That's what James here is mentioning, killing. You have the desire to kill somebody. If you do remember, Jesus was mentioning in Matthew, everyone who is angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. So these people who fight out of frustration, they have their back towards the God. They do not have a proper relationship with God. See, even in, even in um, the book of John, it's written, until now you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive, so that your joy may be made full. The reason why I mention this verse is, most of the people who have that fighting tendency, they fail to pray. But whoever who is listening, who will be listening this, some of them might have a question, or they might object this by saying, oh, I have prayed and prayed for so much, but God hasn't given me whatever I wanted. And for this question, for, for this question, whoever is asking this question, James has an answer for this too. The answer is in the verse 3. If you read carefully, we will have that answer for that question. When you ask, you do not receive. Because you ask with wrong motives. That you may spend with what you get on your pleasures. See, God's promise of answering our prayers and giving us what we ask must be governed by the biblical teaching about the prayers. It's not like we name it and we claim it or we just grab it and go. No. That's not the way God has taught us. If we want to claim a promise, watch carefully. If we want to claim a promise, we must follow the principles. If we don't follow the principles, we cannot claim any of the promises God has given us. What are all the principles we need to follow? It's to just obey Him, trust in Him, have the faith in Him, above all, surrender to Him. You follow these principles, and then claim the promise. I think like um, we all um, are familiar and most of us know these words by heart. First John 3.22 Whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sights. And similarly, the two chapters down, we read in James, uh, 1 John 5.14, this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So we have to ask anything according to his will. It is not according to our will. You can ask anything. But that anything should be succumbing to his will. So James is warning against pleasure-motivated prayer. Hope you understand this. 
spiritual minded Christians, we need to pray for things that are pleasing in God's sight, not for things that fuel our own envious, selfish desire. To give an example, this is the good time of the year to make all the purchases for most of the people who are living here in the U.S. Thanksgiving time. Purchasing cars, purchasing television, purchasing whatever we want to. It's not like purchasing is not bad. But when we try to compare somebody and try to buy something beyond our reach, if our neighbor is buying a 50-inch television, don't try to buy in another 70-inch television just because, like, you want to have a bigger one. That is so simple as it is. If you look into the next verse, it's a very, very harsh word that is being used by James. He just like rubs it right in the face of these people, these harsh words. Look at this. You adulterous people. You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of the world. Why does James is so harsh by addressing these people as adulterous people? Because these people, they are cheating on God. They are cheating on God. Their attention, their affection, it's, it's not towards God. If you do remember these words um, from Matthew 15 and verse 8, Jesus is quoting the same verse from Isaiah 29, 13. Matthew 15, verse 8. See what he says. I'll read from verse 7. He says, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. For he wrote, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. The worship is a farce, for they teach man-made ideas as commands from God. This is exactly what we see today. People are bent away from God and they lean towards most of the earthly things. Again, if you do remember when I started this, I told you James is writing this to Jewish Christian believers. So the word adulterous is mentioning about those people who are believers. He is not writing or addressing this adulteress to unbelievers. You have to remember this. James is referring to Christians committing spiritual adultery. The reason why he is mentioning is, the reason is, this conflict is causing quarrels in the churches. We cannot play politics in ministry. We cannot try to entertain anything else in the church body. Our relationship with Christ should be so genuine. Whatever that brings into our own desires, it is going to split the church 
and destroy the ministry. So far, what we have seen from these first four verses is are the frustrated inner desires. As I told you, like the frustration is the reason for the quarrels and the fights. So the frustrated inner desires lead us to have a murderous thought. The arguments and the failure to pray and praying again with wrong motives. Right? That That's what we saw like. And a heart that is always beating to the rhythm of the world is always opposite to his words and the works of God. You have to remember this. That's the reason I'm stopping now and trying to recapitulate what we did see in this first four verses. If you move on to the fifth and the sixth verse, it says, do you think the scripture have no meaning? They say that God is passionate, that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. And he gives grace generously, as the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. If you look into the meaning of this fifth verse, God is intentionally, intensely jealous for us to honor him with our spirit. He created us for a plan and a purpose to have intimate relationship with him and to always glorify him. When we accepted Jesus Christ as the Savior, we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. God wants control of our lives by His Spirit. By what means? There is only one way. That is surrendering ourselves to His control. That's what the meaning of this fifth verse is. The, the last part of the sixth verse is humbleness. As I told you, if we want to be having an intimate relationship with God, we should be led by the Holy Spirit, not by our spirit. It is His will, His way. It is not going to be our will and His way. I think like I have mentioned this earlier in, in some of my messages. It is always His will and His way. Even if you misplace one of this, we will end up in disaster. So that's the kind of control God wants to have in our lives. If we release our grip and our selfish demands, He'll make sure we are going in the right direction. So this kind of humble surrender to God is the key principle. What we see here is God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. When he gives greater grace, that greater grace is greater than our wills and our selfishness. His grace surpasses everything. The work of the Holy Spirit is to take away our pride from our life 
and teach us to be humble. That's the message we always get from the life of Jesus Christ. We most of the time hear the message during Easter period and we always forget that. The incidents where Jesus Christ washed the feet of his disciples. He humbled himself. He, he was the king. He is the king. But he came as a servant to serve us. That we have to remember. I have got one hymn wherein there are four lines. I'm not going to um, say the whole uh, hymn. This is a hymn from one of the persons called Annie Johnson. That person has written, God giveth more grace when the burden grows greater. God sendeth more strength when the labors increase. To added affliction, he added his mercy. He multiplied the trials. He multiplied the peace. So his grace is beyond our comprehension. But to have that grace and mercy, we need to humble ourselves. And finally, looking at verses 7 to 10, as you read carefully, like, look at this, like, verse 7, it starts with, so humble yourself before God. And if you look into verse 10, he ends that section by saying, humble yourself before the Lord again. So this is a practical advice on how to put the principle of humility into practice with the help of the Holy Spirit. As I did mention earlier, our frustrated pursuit of pleasure is the cause of the fight. And God's spirit of grace is the prescription. That's what James is writing. James now gives us the way we need to apply the cure for our lives here. That's what we see here from verses 7 to 10. And whatever application he mentions here it should be done as a daily practice in a proper dosage. What he says here is humble yourself. Submit to God. This is a command. This is a command for everybody. Submit to God. Don't fight. Don't resist. Don't push off anything, but instead, surrender. Surrender totally. We always have an inbuilt tendency, human beings, always we have this inbuilt tendency to bend away from God. Because we live in a sinful world, the flesh is the same. Only the spirit is new. James is insisting on that. To surrender ourselves. And look into the next verse. It says, Resist the devil and he will flee from you. All of a sudden there isn't nothing happening here. The casting away the demons. But he's saying the proud pursuit of our own 
looks a lot like the Satan's rebellious hearts. If you look into um, Isaiah 14, whenever time permits, look into these verses, Isaiah 14, 13 to 14. It's the devil's rebellious conceit that led to the downfall. So we have to be very careful how we stand. Are we following the demonic world or are we following the spiritual guidelines that are given in the scriptures? And then, followed by that, he says, come close to God and God will come close to you. These are the applications as I told you. James, as a physician, he gives us the prescription. Here is the prescription. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. So in terms of salvation, we can't draw any near to God than we already are. But when we place our trust and faith in Christ to save us, we are immediately baptized by the Holy Spirit. And we are accepted into the body of Christ. That's what we see in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. When we are sealed by the Holy Spirit, we get the redemption. That's what we see in Ephesians 4.30. If you look into Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says like we have been saved. If you look into the words, it is a past tense. We have been saved. By what? by God's grace through faith. Why I mention all these is the redemption, the faith, the saving. These all describes our position in Christ. And our position in Christ cannot be changed. But James, here he is mentioning about our daily relationship with God. Knowing more about Him. Progressing more in relationship with Him. But how do we do it? Look into those verses here. From 8 to 10, it says, Come close to God and God will come close to you. And following these, this, this is very, very important. Look into these verses. Cleanse your hands. Cleanse your hands or wash your hands. What does that mean? Stop doing evil. The next one is purify your hearts. Purify your hearts. What does that mean? Stop thinking evil. Stop thinking evil. And the next one, it says, be miserable and moan and weep. What does that mean? Be miserable and moan and weep. We have to regret for our wickedness. We need to regret for our wickedness and for the evilness in us. And the last one he says is, let, let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to gloom. It says, don't make a joke out of our evilness. Don't make a joke out of our evilness. See, all these commands, whatever we saw now, 
is just a reflection of our inner thoughts and our outward effects of our repentance it's our inner thoughts and outward effects of our repentance if we clench our fist against god and turn away from him with our proud and rebellious ways we will fall flat on our face if you clench your fist against god and turn back with our proudness pride and rebellion we will fall flat on our faces and we can never ever think about the relationship with our almighty god yes he has said like i will cleanse your sin it will be washed as white as snow but still we will have to face the consequences so the words what james uses here in this section end of this section again is humble yourself in the presence of the lord and he will exalt you the message is very very clear very very clear it's very outright here instead of putting up a fight we are supposed to put on faith instead of causing conflict let us have mature contentment in what we have instead of stomping around let us willfully submit ourselves to god one big lesson from this section here is the envy and the jealousiness i do not know how many of you do remember this advertisement from india about a television unida tv i still do remember this owners pride and neighbors envy this was the catch point of this particular advertisement unida tv and the person who comes in that advertisement is almost dressed like a devil like a um, big tooth and the tail and everything the envy that envy and jealousiness is what james is talking about to finish this we will see i want just wanted to pinpoint this one the envy and the jealousiness what happened in the history if you look into the scriptures it was that envy and jealousiness that sold joseph into slavery and it drove david into exile and it was the envy and the jealousiness that threw daniel into the den and finally it was the envy that put christ into trial here paul tells the envy is one of the prevailing traits of depravity i time permits try to read uh, romans 129 that's what paul says so let us examine ourselves and see whether we have that envy or jealousiness it is one good thing we have to thank god that we have these verses the scripture 
words are always active and alive james is also give, giving us the cure here right contentment humbleness let us surrender ourselves and we always hope in him god alone will bring us out of all these sinful habits let us be content in what we have let us surrender ourselves our frustrated hopes we should have missed many of the goals in our life many missed opportunities missed goals you and i we are not alone on this but god makes the poor and the rich he brings low he also exalts us the choice is given to us are we going to be content in what we have are we humbling ourselves surrendering ourselves are we trusting in him let us go back to the same statement what i said if we want to claim the promises are we following the principles are we surrendering ourselves are we trusting in god are we obeying him let us examine ourselves if there is anything that is hindering that will have a hurt in our relationship with god let us humble ourselves surrender ourselves acknowledge to god and he will help us to restore that he is always a faithful god he is that everlasting all kindness all forgiving omnipotent god he always loves us for one good reason that we always humble ourselves and glorify him let us always be reflecting the image of his son jesus christ into which he is molding us and mending us either we want to have a small place in his kingdom or we want to have a lavish living in this world which will be destroyed any moment let us examine ourselves thank you lord thank you lord for speaking to us through your words Thank you, Jesus. Help us always to surrender our will to you, Lord. Lord, it is your love that we reciprocate. You loved us. Thank you for your faithfulness in us, Lord. Though we still do make mistakes in our daily lives, help us to restore our old habits lord we still live in this old flesh we love to do things that will be pleasing to you but we still stumble lord in our lives help us not to have those stumbleness let us always look at you lord look at the cross you have given your son who taught us how to be humble he taught us the humility lord 
Let us always do that. Let us love one another. Let us have that compassion for every other person. Restore our lives, our families, and the place where we work. Let us always be salt and light in the places where we go, where we serve. Let there be more souls that will be always looking at us, Lord, as witnesses. Help us bring more souls to you, Lord. Thank you for leading us throughout this prayer and blessing us and honoring us, Lord. We always glorify you. Glorify your name. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.